So for the rest of the attendees, please, if you have any question, you can raise your hand and I can mute you. Or you can drop the questions in the chat and then I can tell them um, to the speakers. So Jose Antonio, I think we're ready. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you in particular to, uh, to Manny, to Adela, and to Patrick for participating in, the, uh, in this uh, lecture. We, we have the pressure of um, discussing today the, uh, the English version <laughs> of Manny Cetina's book on the Cold War in Latin America. So we look forward to, uh, to the presentation. He uh, is a, a Mormon fellow here at the University of Pinas uh, and, a, 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 and a professor at the University of Pinas. By the way, so far uh, in the College of Mexico. Uh, and, then, and then we have uh, Adela, uh, who is uh, a professor at the University of uh, Houston, a historian uh, uh, of Mexico, uh, with uh, you know, several publications now, including the co-editor of the Charlie Authoritarianism in Mexico, the missionary struggles of the very world. Uh, so the, the, actually the, the period that uh, we're going to discuss uh, and then we have a uh, Patrick Iver, uh, professor at the University of uh, Wisconsin, uh, uh, who has written extensively about the Cold War, uh, and uh, particularly uh, uh, his book, uh, Neither Peace Nor Freedom, The Cultural uh, Cold War in Latin America, where we examine how artists, writers, and intellectuals participated in, uh, in the Cold War. With that, let me give the floor there to the panel for the presentation, and then we'll probably be a uh, comment by Anena and Pat. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, thank uh, everybody. I mean, much more people on Zoom than in this room. I think it's the new, it's the new normality. Then uh, it's fine. It's a bit weird, <laughs> but uh, we will have to get used to that. I, I'm afraid. Um, so good evening. First of all, let me thank uh, Islas Columbia uh, for hosting me as a Mormon scholar uh, during uh, this month. Um, and of course, also for hosting and helping with the organization of this panel. Uh, I want to especially thank Andrea Oropesa, uh, the center, the ILA Center Assistant, for all the work she put in the organization of this event. Um, and I also want to thank CONACYT, uh, the Mexican institution that oversees uh, science uh, in the country, for the support it has given until now uh, to the O'Gorman Scholars Program. It's a bit saddening to know that CONACYT has not committed to keep uh, supporting this program, uh, which uh, has allowed Mexican and Colombia-based scholars uh, to work together, exchanging uh, ideas, uh, debating and discussing on topics of common interest as we are doing uh, this. Uh, this uh, one can only hope they, they change their, their mind at some point. Um, and finally, let me thank uh, today's speaker, uh, Adela Cedillo, uh, Patrick Iger, and Jose Antonio Campo for moderating uh, this, uh, this event. And also the brave people who made it to Columbia University and uh, to this to this room, uh, they're really great. Okay, so I'm gonna give uh, um, offer you a sort of general context, right, of, of the book, uh, and I'm gonna focusing on the first part, first chapter of the book, uh, which deals with problems of uh, definitions, conceptualizations, and and, and chronologies uh, of Latin America's uh, Latin America's book. Um, obviously, uh, for what I have just said, my intervention is going to be based on some of the reflection and develop in, in the Historia Minima, uh, 
de la Grafía en América Latina, a book that was published by a colleague de Mexico a few years ago, and that, that has been now translated and published into English by the University of North Carolina uh, Press uh, with, the title, with the title of uh, Compact History of Latin Americans. So, uh, historical thinking has the peculiarity of uh, trying to reach political, social, cultural, or economic processes, trying to place them in the specific place and in a specific time. So when as historians, for example, we study the 1917 Russian Revolution, for example, uh, the political, economic, cultural features of the Russian empires uh, are for us crucial in order to retrace the unfolding of the process leading to the 1917 Revolution. It's time that for us plays the most important role in our attempts to explain those processes. So time is for us both a descriptive, descriptive tool, let's say the October Revolution, the February provisional government, so far, so forth, no? are example of how you use uh, time expression to describe a lot of political, uh, political uh, process. But most importantly, time for us is a hermeneutical tool used to understand uh, process, to sort uh, out political, social, cultural, uh, historical process. Uh, for historians, processes unfold diachronically according to a specific chronology whose definition is actually crucial in order to understand the causal connections of events of which those very same processes are compounded. So the October Revolution would be hardly understandable without considering the failure of the 1917 Cornelius coup, um, a coup that failed mainly thanks to the intervention of workers and pro Bolshevik soldiers, proving, proving to the Bolsheviks that they had enough strength to try and seize the power. So building periodizations and chronologies is crucial for our interpretative process. And that's the reason why historians spend such an astonishing amount of time thinking and discussing about time. And in fact, time is the main reason we are here, we are actually here today and having this panel. No? So I'm gonna talk about possible uh, definition of the Cold War in Latin America, which are strictly connected to the problem of uh, the chronologies that we use to define uh, those processes. So when I began thinking about uh, how to write and frame this book, my first challenge was how to define what was Latin America's Cold War. Historiography of Latin America's Cold War, as we uh, all know, has evolved importantly during the last 15, 20 years. We have now excellent case studies focused on countries, problem, processes, um, but there are still few books seeking to address the Cold War regionally as a whole and to offer a comprehensive interpretation of the phenomenon. So along with scarce literature on Cold War, scarce attempts to offer general uh, overviews of, of the Cold War in Latin America, my challenge was uh, to understand if it, it actually makes sense at all to talk of in Latin America's uh, Cold War, especially considering that the Cold War, at least in its inception, was mainly a European process which involved the two superpowers, but mainly focused on the Eurasian fields or, or the Eurasian sea. And in order to define what was and if there was a Latin America's Cold War at all, uh, time and periodization were my most urgent tasks. Because depending on the chronology I was able to build, to think, and to frame, the definition of the Cold War, as we will see, uh, addressing the historiography on this topic, uh, the, few, the few books written on there. Uh, so depending on that chronology, uh, also my definition of the Cold War as a historical process would also change accordingly. So the first uh, section of, of the book, the one focused on chronologies and definition, um, is actually built against the backdrop 
backdrop of the dialogue I maintain with a group of important historians, which are among the few to have also undertaken in the past the challenging task of defining Latin America. And most of those historians are dealing with problems of chronology. Um, and actually, uh, although these scholars offer slightly different approaches on the problem of what was the Cold War in America, uh, I think we can, uh, we can argue uh, that they all share a common long to the approach to definition of the Cold War in Latin America. So they may have um, um, difference in terms of exactly when or exactly what defined the Cold War, but uh, they all share uh, a long-term approach. Uh, so the Cold War is a long process that actually did not start in 1947, where when the Orthodox Cold War is usually uh, made, uh, start. But it is a much longer uh, historical so let's take a look at those long way approaches and why I don't think uh, they work completely well in terms of defining what was the Cold War in Latin America. So in my presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on my criticism of those historiographical interpretations. And I hope that in the QA uh, section, and I'm sure through uh, Adela's and Patrick's comments, uh, um, comments on my proposal. Okay? Because it's not, it's not just a matter of criticizing those approaches, but also of offering an alternative explanation. Um, so the first long durée approach um, is being made by Greg Ramsey and Gilbert Uh Their approach is um, delineated in the introduction and the conclusion they wrote uh, for an edited volume uh, whose title is A Century of Revolution, Insurgent and Counterinsurgent Violence During Latin America's Long Cold War. Uh, it's a book that has become quite influential uh, in our field, especially in terms of uh, how we think about the Latin America's Cold War. Uh, Basically, in the intro and the conclusions, Randy and Joseph argue that the Cold War, understood as the period beginning in 1947, did not actually represent a particularly novel stage for Latin America, but simply a moment of acceleration and intensification of processes which were already unfolding in Latin America by the end of the 19th century and more clearly by the time of the 1910 Mexican uh, Revolution. Um, in this long way approach, uh, Latin American modern history is basically read by Randy and Joseph as the product of a conflicting dialectic between, on the one hand, revolutionary violence, mainly rooted in the countryside, according to Randy's, Randy's introduction to them. Um, and on the other hand, counter-revolutionary reaction enacted by Latin American conservative forces with the external support of Washington hegemonic projection. Uh, if you allow me, I'll use the term imperialism. It's, it's, a, it's becoming, uh, I think, uh, once again, fashionable and usable in academic context. Um, so the Cold War, as I say, would not therefore represent an autonomous era according to this view, but a stage of radicalization of that violence produced by the clash between revolution and uh, capital. Uh, capital. So 1946, 1947 are not particularly relevant um, uh, dates um, for according to, to, to this approach. Because what, 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 uh, what happened uh, when the, let's say, orthodox Cold War began is just an intens intensification of that violence, mostly because of the power gained by uh, the United States as global, and not just an hemisphere. Now, there are a few interpretative problems uh, which I think we should discuss here in regard to this proposal. Um, the first one is that 
if this definition aims to describe such a long time period, the first problem it faces is the different capacity US imperialists had over the region before and after World War II. What I mean is that Washington's hegemony was not so extensive in Latin America during the end of the 19th century, or even the first part of the 20th century, uh, as it became after the end of World War II and during the Cold War over the whole region. To be more precise, in such countries like Argentina, Chile, or Brazil, you know, just to give a few examples, quite relevant examples though, Washington imperialists did not become such a dramatic challenge until the 1940s and most of them would say the end of World War II and the Cold um, But I, I would say that is exactly the Cold War that pushed back Washington toward a more, much more conservative interpretation of its hegemonic power. Um, uh, that made that imperial uh, parody uh, uh, stronger uh, again uh, after 1947. Uh, um, so as you can see, one of the key features of this long durée definition, right, does not work because it does not take sufficiently into account the changes in Washington foreign policy throughout time, and particularly between and before, uh, I'm sorry, before and after uh, the Cold War actually uh, began. The second problem is violence itself, or the idea that Latin American history can be read as a long continuum of rural violence, mostly rural violence, against which it was opposed counter-revolutionary violence, mainly supported by, uh, by the United States. And here time becomes important again, once again. Uh, such a long way approach seems to neglect the fact that during the 1930s and the 1940s, for example, social conflict was channeled or addressed in Latin America, not only through revolutionary processes, but actually more significantly so, I would say, through reformist projects. The Frentes Populares in Chile during the 1930s, the Autentico Governments in Cuba during the 1940s, the beginning of such a typical Latin American uh, project, populist experiments in Brazil first and Argentina later, or even Cardenismo in Mexico, I would say, are all good examples of social changes coming from the hand of reformists and not exactly revolutionary projects or processes. Moreover, during the 1940s, I think that it's hard to argue that Washington systematically opposed such Latin America for this project. And in fact, Washington did not oppose those, those projects. Again, I would say that it was with the beginning of the Cold War uh, that US foreign policy swung back to its more traditional, aggressive, conservative position in terms of foreign policy towards uh, Latin America. The 1930s and the 1940s, for several reasons, I discussed them in the book, were marked by the year of the good neighbor diplomacy. We can think that that was just a pragmatic readjustment, or we can think that the International New Deal actually had much in common with some, uh, with the agenda of uh, the nationalist uh, reformist actors in Latin America. In either cases, it was a real thing uh, that changed the inter-American dynamic during that period. So we should uh, take that into consideration. And, and uh, or we adopt a theological approach. And so we decided that that was an accident because history goes in one direction, or we ask ourselves why that period came to an end. Okay, so why Washington foreign policy changed so drastically after 19. My interpretation is that the Cold War, the geopolitical conflict in the Soviet Union, played an important role in producing uh, that, that change. And finally, the idea that violence can be seen as a variable that we can move through alpha of the center 
of the Latin American century without wondering if its root, rationals, and simple unfolding may have changed to time, it's, it seems to me equally questionable. Now, the idea that end of 19th century violence, Mexican revolutionary violence, or Cold War violence is the same kind of violence defining such a long period. I think it's, it's hard to, uh, to sustain. Let's, let's give you a few examples. In the Southern Cone, for example, as shown by the work of Aldo Marchesi, we know that revolutionary violence was, during the late 1960s and the 1970s, mostly an urban, not a rural. No. So it's hard to compare that with the violence that Grandin and Gilbert Joseph are using uh, in order to define this long uh, American century of revolution. But even in Mexico, where rural guerrilla continued to play an important role in the 1960s, in the 1970s, even Mexico saw dramatic expansion of urban revolutionary violence. Uh, and I would say in Mexico and as in the Southern Cone, violence became urban, more in the Southern Cone or urban than in Mexico. Um, because during the 1930s and the 1940s, Latin American societies had radically changed in terms of economic and social structures. So even violence changed according uh, to how uh, society were uh, experimenting with important transformation. You know? So violence parallels we use for the end of the 19th century or the era of the Mexican Revolution I don't think that they can be uncritically applied to the Cold War era. In the end, there is a broader problem uh, that uh, affects our discipline. Uh, so this use of violence as a sort of an atemporal category uh, is problematic because I think it highlights a tendency in our discipline to replace historical rationality with a sort of sociological where we use this category and remove them uh, quite uh, without taking into consideration the nuances of the moment, um, the peculiarity, peculiarities of the political spaces we are analyzing so far, uh, so forth. So, uh, I mean, it's something that I think we can observe happening in general terms in, in, in our piece. Now, uh, finally, uh, with regard to this point, uh, I would say that my feeling is that this specific long way approach might work to describe the nature of political dynamics in Central America, perhaps even during the Cold War, even if even in Central America they would need some kind of quantification, you know, in terms of again, in terms of what is happening in, in, in those countries, and if we can assume that. Time is the same between 19th century and the 1970s, even in Latin America, which I, I, I would agree are the societies that um, have more difficulties in, in, in change. Um, but in any case, I don't think we can use that approach uh, neither to describe the whole Latin America's contemporary history and certainly not to define Latin America's whole world. Uh, the second author with whom I debate in my book is Tanya Harman, a uh, scholar, who offers what I think is an extremely stimulating attempt to conceptualize Latin America as a whole world. And uh, Tanya is also the author of terrific books, whose uh, uh, case studies I was mentioning at the beginning of her work in Chile, uh, Allende, and now her last book in the place Allende are. Social groups uh, in Chile or the world. Um, in terms of Harmer attempt to offer a, a, a general um, interpretation of what was Latin America's Cold War, Harmer basically recovers Army Westat's emphasis on ideology as a defining element of the Cold War and used this emphasis on the ideology to seek to conceptualize also Latin America's Cold War. So for Hammer, we could grosso modo 
start to think of a Latin America's Cold War by the time of the 1917 Russian Revolution, where Marxist Leninist socialist in Europe, but also in Latin America, according to Harmer, and capitalists became the two poles for the articulation of social control. So on the one hand, a specific form of social, Marxist Leninist socialist, no? uh, strictly connected in the 1917 revolution. Um, and on the other hand, capitalism as no, the engine of uh, social conflict in Europe and I generally agree with Westphal and Harmer, whose work I really appreciate. Uh, so their emphasis on ideology. Uh, where I do disagree is in the way that this ideological scheme is projected over a political space, Latin America, which during the 1920s, 1930s, and 40s maintained a high level of ideological variety, syncretism, and experimentations which do not exactly overlap with Marxist socialism. So uh, basically, my point is that uh, during those three decades, uh, social conflicts in Latin America was channeled through different ideological uh, devices, not necessarily Marxist lens. I'll say it more. So it's absolutely true that the 1970 revolution had an impact, important impact in shaping Latin America's ideological debate. But I think that the idea of a Marxist-Leninist homogeneity in Latin America during the 1920s and 30s was actually more a projection of Latin American conservative groups, visions, and fears rather than a reality. The degree of syncretism in Latin America progressive groups was quite remarkable during the 1930s and the 1940s. So just to give an example, APRA, you know, uh, one of the most important Latin American political actors uh, in the 30s and 40s, was certainly influenced, especially during its formative years, by the Bolshevik Revolution. But that was neither its only source of ideological inspiration, nor throughout the years, it's mostly, uh, it's most defining uh, one. Again, other progressive groups, quite influential during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, supported important social um, reforms agenda, but in some cases, they were explicitly non-Marxist. Again, like the authentic governments in Cuba, um, or the Orthodox, okay? Uh, the party to which Castro uh, belonged. Uh, actually, in the case of, uh, of the uh, Partido Orthodox's leader, Edi Chibas, I think we can say that his position was quite anti communist And in other cases, like with the Bolivian MNR, Peronist, Bartis, I would say that these groups were explicitly anti communist So, as you say, variety is much higher in the Latin American context than it was in Europe. Um, I'm going to towards the conclusion. So this variant of long durée approach, I mean, the, the variant elaborated by Armour, uh, sometimes it reminds me of Eric Hosbrook, uh, short century periodization, 1917, 1989, uh, which certainly works in Europe where Marxist, socialist, and capitalist work by the end uh, of the 19th century, starting to become preponderant ideologies. But it's hard to apply it to the Latin American context, which, as I've just said, was marked by autonomous political and social trends, which in some cases, or I would say many cases, were quite different from those of the in Europe. Um, and actually, I would say that, again, uh, it was the beginning of the Cold War in 1946-47, which uh, was the start of the date, that actually, strongly polarized Latin American political scenarios also produced an homogenization of the ideological realm. So we start to see disappearing uh, these, uh, these, these um, kind of experimentations. And we tend to see progressive group moving towards one of those two poles, okay? Capitalist or Marxist uh, uh, socialist. 
I would say that Fidel Castro is, is a great example of this of this shift. You know, but I'm glad I mentioned the Orthodox Party, you know, and I highlighted that it was an anti-communist party because Castro, before genuinely embracing the ideological and geopolitical uh, Soviet socialism, had been part of a progressive nationalist party that was actually anti-communist, and uh, I mean. It was the polarization and the challenge posed by that polarization that I, I would say pushed Castro towards his, uh, I wouldn't call it a, a conversion because it's sort of a majority uh, terms, uh, but it, it, his shift uh, toward uh, Soviet, Soviet socialism. So it's against these uh, criticism of long durée approaches, which in my book I try to delineate a different chronology marked, also marked by different uh, time mm, Again, I think that I'll have a chance to talk more about uh, this approach during, during the Q&A and comments, or reply to comment. But just to give you like a few uh, highlights. Um, so in the book, my attempt is to rescue some of the contribution developed by Latin American historians, particularly Julio Alpringongi political history. Alpringongi uh, is, is, is one of the few also uh, sold to write a general uh, overview of Latin American contemporary history. His book is not called Latin America's Cold War History, but a good part of, of one of his volumes is focused on the period uh, following the end of World War II. So I'm trying in the book to uh, recover some of the insights that that book still offers today. And I try to combine them actually uh, with uh, Latin American economic history. So uh, basically, Bertolo Campo, uh, standard book you know, on the history of, uh, of Latin American uh, economies. Um, so, in doing so, um, what I propose is much more a history of fractures and discontinuities rather than the history of continues to define Latin America's, uh, Latin America's war. Um, um, and my focus is much more, I would say, on a traditional periodization, uh, which sees the Cold War in Latin America beginning only after the proper Cold War began, you know, 1947. Uh, uh, but I'm trying to root the impact uh, of that, of the beginning of the geopolitical conflict in a Latin American context, who's using not just Dongi and Andrei Dongi and Bertolo Campo, but those are the main examples of the kind of literature that I'm trying to use to build the structure of. of, of. Um, so I would like it here and, and, and see what, what you think. I have just said what I wrote. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Bunny, uh, for that uh, very interesting presentation. A few questions that the maker. <laughs> uh, but let me uh, give the turn now to Arena. She can unmute herself. Uh, you have to please unmute her. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah no, very good. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you to Dr. Vani Petina uh, for the invitation. And uh, thank you to the Latin American Studies at Columbia University for hosting this event. Um, I will provide uh, more general comments on the book in a more tra traditional way, because I, I, I think that every chapter really offers a important insights to understand the novelty of this, uh, of this handbook. Um, and I will read my comments because I only have 10 times, so I hope I won't be too, I, do, I won't take too, uh, much more time. Uh, let me put my timer, okay. Um, so Albany uh, Petina's monography on the Latin the American Cold War provides a tremendous analytical synthesis of, of the period 
Echoing the Contemporary History of Latin America by Tulio Halper and Dongi, that was um, um, released in 1970. A compact history of Latin America's Cold War draws on the most recent historiography to offer a vision that updates what traditional currents had said about the subject and lays out some of the new interpretative models about the region's developmental milestones. And as I was uh, listening to Vani, uh, some of the, 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 the approaches and the topics uh, or, or the way that, that Vani frames this, these topics are now part of a common sense to us. Like this, this doesn't sound like new anymore, but this is new in the sense that it took uh, decades to consolidate this, this, new, uh, this new framework. Um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, this, this was not the case. Um, so while Petina aims to provide um, high school students and academic, academics uh, unfamiliar, I mean, Petina aims to provide high school students and academics unfamiliar uh, with an, an, an introductory overview of the subject. And however, um, this is, well, this is the audience, but, but the analytical framework and bibliography make this book a valuable text for a specialized audience too, because it, it has um, this bibliographic, uh, bibliography essay has a balance between the Spanish and English scholarship, which is not very common in the historiography of the Cold War uh, that is uh, predominantly in English language. So I, I think this is this is important um, for someone who wants who wants also to look at what the, the Latin America has produced about the, the, the Cold War in Spanish. There are two aspects that I would like to emphasize about this book. Uh, first of all, uh, the analytical framework uh, is inspired by the, by, the, by the historiography produced in the last two decades, which underscored the dynamics of the global South beyond the bipolar conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. This historiography invites us to understand the complexity of Latin America and their actors on their own without denying the influence of US hegemony. And, and what, what, what Bani was just uh, telling about the, how we should um, historicize this, this um, the, the, like the expansion of this uh, hegemony, not, not usual, sometimes uh, some old, Fashion corridors take it for granted, but what we should understand, like the different moments in which the, the US hegemony arrives in each country, right? And the, the second point is uh, the emphasis that the author gives to structural analysis. Uh, different fields in the Latin American Cold War historiography, like diplomatic history and political history, for around the agency of individuals or collectivities as the most important explanatory factor. Petinas structural and holistic approach remind us of the importance of understanding the impact of long-term economic processes in phenomena like the military coups and the armed conflicts in the region. And when I, I, am, I'm, I'm, I, I, I mentioned this long-term, it's not that, well, the, the, the long durée uh, approach that he just criticized, but in, in, a, in the, most, the most structural sense of how these uh, economic structures played a role in, in the explanation of uh, phenomenon um, um, and, and processes that people usually attribute to agency, like the decision of an individual, this in, a group of individuals, these elites, or these groups that are challenging the hegemony of the state, or and and we um, usually forget about like connect. Well, not we all, but, but some historians, some some others, for, like don't connect these different dimensions. Um, so I, I like uh, that Bani emphasizes that. And well, he already explains the chronology, the chronology of, of his book that is well more traditional from, from the 1946, after the end of the, the World War II to the fall of the Soviet bloc in the 80s. And uh, well, the geographical scope is also, also traditional, covers well what, what we understand as um, the whole region, Latin America, Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. And well, Petina, um, something that I like about, a lot about this book is that it has very, very clear objectives um, that he mentions in the, in the introduction, like elaborating a critical reflection on the super, superposition of global and local phenomena in Latin America, 
um, this is like kind of the base of this, uh, what, he called, well, what is called the news history of the Cold War, this emphasis on the interplay of, of the, these different dimensions, the global, the local, um, um, in, 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 Latin, in, well, in every region. Uh, another objective, objective is delineating the processes, problems, and turning points that mark trends at continental level. I, I enjoy um, how in every chapter Bunny is like uh, highlighting these patterns. And um, a third objective is a, the uh, underpinning the autonomy of Latin American processes in their adaptation to the dynamics produced, produced by the bipolar conflict. So the, the Latin American responses, um, particular responses to, 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 this, um, to, to this conflict, to, to this global conflict. And four, uh, contributing to the construction of tools to conceptualize uh, the specificity of the region. Um, and as I told you, each chapter provides uh, like thought-provoking approaches or, 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 or ideas uh, related to this new, cold, new approach, on, you know, new framework of the, the Cold War. Um, so the book is divided in, in five uh, thematic chronological parts. Uh, the, the first four parts, in my opinion, are the most interesting and, and, and revealing um, the, um, the because well the, for instance the first part is uh, presents the historiographical and conceptual framework of the Cold War in Latin, um, and, 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 and in Latin America based on, on, on this, uh, structural analysis which is not related to uh, dependency theory Marxism or other uh, structuralist currents that were invoked in the 70s but consist of observing the long and medium term economic and political patterns to produce a comparative history. So the, 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 every single chapter is, is constantly comparing different uh, countries and, 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 and patterns. The second part of the book analyzes the impact of the first years of the global Cold War in Latin America. Shall we know homogeneous evolution in the region? Uh, Petina describes how the different countries adapted to the destabilizing political, ideological, and economic pressure, pressures generated by the tensions between the US and the USSR, which is intersected with local processes, uh, producing different outcomes. So for the author, one of the major tensions of the period uh, was a clash between the developmentalist, protectionist, or stat statist models on the one hand, and the free, the free trade model based on primary exports, on the other hand. Uh, so the emphasis on sub-regional variations is beneficial for understanding the different levels of polarization that each country experienced from the 1960s onwards. And this is when uh, the reason because I, I, I mentioned the, the importance of the economic aspect of it. The third part of the book examines the case of the Cuban revolution as a turning point in regional history. Petina uses the geostrategic maneuver, maneuvering of Fidel Castro's regime as a threat to discuss the reception of the Cuban example in each, in each subregion, in which it contributed to steering of revolutionary attempts that were followed by counterinsurgency responses. And this chapter also marks a shift from a structural to geopolitical analysis. Petina seconds the historiography that claims that Cuba became a kind of leftist micropole bike by the USSR, and that the island was by far the most influential country in the region after the United States. I agree with this um, interpretation, uh, although it's, uh, as I, I told you 10 years, but 20 years ago, it was not a common currency. This chapter also discusses the overall vision of the Alliance for Progress launched by John Kennedy's administration to contain communism in Latin America. But in Patina highlights the arguments by authors who have convincingly demonstrated that the alliance was not a mere act of good faith, but included a counterinsurgency project to stamp out social and armed movements. However, local processes support the US project, which could not prevent the advance of guerrilla movements from the 60s through the 1980s. Um, and I think this, this is a book that every a scholar um, of the, the, the US American, American Cold War should read because uh, there, are, there are still such romanticization of, of Kennedy without understanding like, his, the role of his administration in, in, in Latin America and Asia and, and elsewhere in relationship with this counterinsurgency project. Um, 
The fourth part of the book deals with the 1970s, a decade in which a state terror spread out from Mexico, um, ah, my time is over, from Mexico to the southern cone with varying intensity levels. Petina stresses how the outbreak of armed violence in the region occurred against the backdrop of the bipolar conflict since the United States and the USSR were in a phase of the tent. Um, the author not only looks at emblematic cases of military dictatorships and the so-called dirty wars, such as Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay, but also mentions atypical cases that are usually leave out of the conversation, like, like Mexico and Peru. In the Peruvian case, the military dictatorship of Juan Velasco Alvarado uh, carried out a de developmentalist policy with redistributed, with re the redistributive uh, overtones especially the agrarian reform. In the case of Mexico, there was a paradoxical situation in which the administration of Luis Echeverria promoted a third world agenda, developmentalism, and seemingly progressive policies while simultaneously perpetrating a dirty war against the revolutionary left. This chapter also points out the importance of the scholarship of this, on the silent majority, a phenomenon that dictatorial governments use to legitimize themselves even though many people remain silent out of fear and not because they supported the dictatorships. Um, the chapter's geopolitical perspective allows a better uh, understanding of Brazil and Argentina's role in their attempts to counterbalance Cuba. In the Chilean case, Petina underscores that President Salvador Allende, the great symbol of the peaceful road to socialism, ideologically and materially supported the armed struggle in the region to break the isolation of the socialist countries, mimicking the geostrategic purposes of Cuba. Another essential aspect that the comparative analysis reveals is that the military dictatorship did not have a joint project beyond putting an end to the developmentalist model and eradicating the left. The only case where the, there was a direct transition to neoliberalism was Chile. Um, and, and well, my time is over, but I will just say a couple of comments more. So even though, well, for those of us who, who have uh, followed, well, the, the evolution of the historiography of the Cold War in Latin America, this um, might not seem like um, new or groundbreaking ideas, but the, what the interesting, what was very interesting and, and, and thought provoking for me is that when Bani puts all these historiography, all these ideas together, the, the, we can see like the general picture. And the general picture is the one that reveals something new. And because we can understand better the interactions and, and, and intersections and overlappings of all these processes um, that happen simultaneously in the region. And where the, the last part is devoted to, to the civil wars in, in Central America is a, a part of that that unlike previous chapters don't don't, don't discuss like don't discusses doesn't discuss new arguments um it's, it's more um a more traditional um, um approach on the subject and and well the 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 the, the, the book is mostly focused on um political and social and economic history there are other um, topics that are not part of the discussion, uh, for instance, um, the international espionage, the birth of the human rights movement in the region, uh, the role of exiles um, in different countries, the development of drug trafficking in countries like Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia, the migratory crisis that accompanied the Central American wars, and so on. But Despite, uh, well, of course, we cannot expect that a, a handbook can cover every single topic related to the Cold War. And despite the exclusion of these topics, the work more than fulfills its tax of, of, of during the idea that Latin America was a mere receptacle of influence and pressures from the United States and uh, to a lesser extent the USSR. And it's a helpful reference for under, under understanding the background of the regional processes in the 21st century. So I will highly recommend this book uh, for people teaching um, Latin American, the Latin American Cold War at college level. Uh, I think it's, it's going to be a, 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 a book that really is um, going to clarify mono, most of the main arguments um, of the most recent historiography. And um, well, uh, congratulations, Vani, for having this book now in English uh, soon to be released. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adela. Uh, and so I now give the floor to Patrick.
Yeah. There we are. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, congratulations, Vanny. I'm delighted that this excellent book, which has been available, of course, for a few years now in Spanish, is available in English as well. Uh, and I'm delighted to see so many uh, wonderful colleagues, scholars of the Cold War and friends here uh, in, in the audience. I'm looking forward to seeing you all again in person one of these days. We'll see when it happens. Um, <laughs> All right, uh, uh, let me stick to my time. I'm gonna launch a few, uh, I don't know, provocations, uh, questions that we can take up in discussion, but I'd like to begin by sort of building on um, what you started with, Bonnie, you're uh, breaking down the different historiographical schools uh, that have competed for interpretations of Latin America's Cold War. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and then I'm going to get back in at the, at the end of uh, my, my comments. Um, uh, let me begin with the observation of another uh, Italian scholar, Benedetto Croci, who aphorized that all history is contemporary history. And note that we are gathered today at a moment when, as scholars and students of the Cold War have not failed to notice, there's much wondering as to whether a second Cold War is underway. Uh, now, on the one hand, I do not wish to commit the sin of presentism by judging the past by the standards of the present seems a silly thing to waste a sin on, uh, among other reasons. But I do think that thinking through the current moment might help us to clarify what is at stake about the way that we define the Cold War and why it's important to spend so much time thinking about questions like periodization, um, which might seem, uh, on the one hand, like uh, sort of the parlor games that historians play rather than something that is urgent. But I think it is urgent. Uh, a few months ago, I was asked to contribute to a forum about whether or not the world was embarking on a new Cold War. And in order to decide what I thought about that, because I wasn't sure when the question was put to me, I forced myself to enumerate what I thought was a conceptual list of the characteristics of the first Cold War. And what I decided uh, were the keys were uh, the following four things. Uh, number one, that the Cold War was a bipolar great power conflict. Number two, that it had the potential to erupt into violence between the two powers, creating existential global risk. But in practice, this prevented direct military conflict, which pushed competition into espionage and fighting into hot zones, um, as many have observed. You know, the Cold War is not cold in Latin America. Uh, third, that the conflict burrowed its way into all layers of global politics, effectively making the United States and the Soviet Union participants in the political coalitions of governments all across the globe. This is something that I think you treat very, very effectively in the introduction and throughout the, throughout the book. Uh, and fourth, that the conflict pitted two fundamentally opposed systems against each other uh, that, and they competed to prove not only their military superiority, but also their superiority as ways of arranging human affairs and distributing the products of human achievements. Uh, so when I drafted that piece, I concluded that there were important areas of overlap between the Cold War moment and our own time. Let's say we were something like 80% of the way there on all four metrics, giving us an overall score of 3.2 out of four on the Cold Warometer. Uh, there were important points of divergence. It noted that the world's current configuration is unlikely to be bipolar. Uh, that there are more similarities this time between apparently rival systems than there were in the last go around between communism and capitalism as the two poles of conflict. And there's also a kind of accelerated quality to the experience that we're having right now. If planetary risk is more climate change than nuclear weapons, though still a bit of the latter, then the incentives for international cooperation between the US and China, let's say, are already in place, uh, where, which is more in alignment with the middle period of the Cold War than with its beginning. And then with a solid and I thought quite thoughtful draft submitted and me feeling good about the solidity of my conclusions, Russia invaded Ukraine and I was forced to make some hasty edits. It was a reminder of how quickly what seemed to be solid assumptions can melt into air. And it was also a moment to observe the taking of positions in public. You know, if people say that journalism is the first draft of history, in this case, it felt to me that pundits were writing the second draft of scholarship without necessarily improving on it. Rather than historiographical waves of orthodoxy, revisionism, post-revisionism, and post 
post-revisionism and whatever it is that we call the trends that have flourished since then, it was easy to identify in real time who was offering an orthodox interpretation of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, uh, Ambassador Michael McCall, Mike McFall, anybody? Uh, the revisionist takes, uh, maybe the DSA International Committee, uh, the post-revisionist takes, they were all there on display simultaneously. And rather than a sort of chronological development of scholarly understanding, which of course always overlapped between competing schools, the interpretation simply existed simultaneously where they competed for plausibility. And here the stakes are very clear because there's an ongoing conflict where lives are lost daily. And insofar as one opinion, one's opinion about it matters at all, there are questions to be asked about how to minimize human suffering. It also raised for me at least uh, interesting questions about the importance of periodization, because it seems to me that at some point a consensus emerges that a second Cold War has begun. It may be that future historians think that it began at a time when very few people on the planet thought that it was happening. Uh, in, in other words, if let's say the invasion of Ukraine is sort of functionally equivalent to the Korean War in the second Cold War, uh, it may be that people conclude, well, yes, but this process sort of began with the Obama administration's pivot to Asia, or perhaps that the pivot to Asia was a sign that it was happening even before that, uh, even though there were very few people at the time who thought that they were in a state uh, of Cold War. That would be different from the, from the first one, um, although it did take people a little while to catch up to the descriptive terms for what was happening. These, it seems to me, suggest the stakes of the problem of Cold War periodization. Uh, how we define the period is how we define the problem, and how we define the problem might suggest, one can only hope, some escape hatches that we could still crawl out of, even now, to prevent a return of the first Cold War's most destructive characteristics. So, in that spirit, let me return to your book. Uh, the argument that you make is that there are two transformations taking place that define the Cold War. One is a socioeconomic transformation with deeper roots and then there's a political layer that gets placed over this. The effect in aggregate is that it makes it easier to build conservative coalitions and more difficult to build uh, leftist or reformist funds because the popular front strategy is no longer available uh, due to changes in communist strategy and changes in US fears, in order, due in other words to the politics of uh, the Cold War. Uh, I would note uh, that uh, William Booth, who I think is here in the audience, in a very interesting essay in the historical journal, which I would recommend to any of you in the audience who are not familiar with it, takes this argument and pushes it uh, further, suggesting that the Cold War would be should be understood as a kind of layered stack of conflicts of varying durations, conflicts between landlord and village that go back hundreds of years, conflicts between state and citizen, conflicts between over US hegemony and national sovereignty, capital and labor, capitalism and socialism, and only then arriving at the US led bloc versus USSR led bloc, which is the one that defines the period that arrives after the end of the Second World War. Um, now, uh, either the approach that, uh, that you take or the approach that, um, that William Booth takes in extending this seems to be very productive uh, and attentive to the complexities of periodization, the purpose of which, after all, is to draw our attention to shifts in structure. Um, uh, but uh, the, the danger that accompanies them is that they risk exaggerating the differences between eras rather than showing the continuities. And that's why the kind of layered approach uh, that, you both, that you both use, I think, is an extremely productive way uh, of thinking about uh, these kinds of uh, problems. Uh, so let me pose a couple of challenges for discussion. But one thing that strikes me as noteworthy about theorizing and periodizing the Cold War is uh, the relative absence of analysis of shifts in US policy. Uh, obviously, there are many ways in which we've tried to move beyond the kind of US centrism, but of course we can never forget the, the power and uh, influence of the United States. Um, uh, there are, acknowledgements perhaps that Kennedy represents some kind of change from Eisenhower, although there are many doubts about that as uh, Adela has just recently reminded us, uh, or that Johnson is some kind of swing of the pendulum back after Kennedy's death towards a more traditional hegemonic posture, what have you, or there are changes from Nixon, Kissinger to Carter, and you know, get into these throughout the, the book. Um, but when we step back and start thinking about periodizing the Cold War and defining the 
the Cold War, US policy is presented as relatively static. Now that could be because there are the, the continuities between administrations are simply too significant, uh, a point which I think is, <laughs> it's a, is certainly one that is worth taking very, very seriously. But I do think that it is important because not all of the identifiably, I don't know, Cold War regimes are conservative. Of course, many of them are. Um, but uh, the, as, as you said in your opening remarks, Fanny, um, there are governments as well that, uh, that embrace a kind of Cold War logic of reform. Um, the Frey government in Chile, for example, and its non-socialist reformist project is just as deep in the Cold War swamp as anybody uh, and enjoyed uh, US support for at least parts of that uh, project. And so I think one of the things that's important to ask about the Cold War in Latin America is why that, form, that particular formation struggled so much in the Cold War. It's probably most successful in Costa Rica, but that's a relatively minor example, right? Well, I, should, I say with no, uh, no, no disrespect intended towards Costa Rica. Um, perhaps one answer might lie in throwing on another layer in order to recognize that there are multiple US Cold War policies operating simultaneously, responding to different political coalitions in the US itself. So at minimum, there's a kind of liberal arm and a conservative arm which have many areas of coincidence and some areas of divergence. And they don't just get switched on or off with new administrations. They always coexist, though sometimes the balance between them uh, shifts. And that might be uh, something worth, uh, worth thinking about. Um, finally, if we now return to the president and adopt the argument about conservative coalitions and the Cold War made by Vani, it, it absolutely would make sense according to this argument, that we would see some sort of turn to the left in the region after the end of the Cold War, because the explanation for uh, what has happened during the Cold War is that it has put pressure on, uh, uh, on coalitions and made it, uh, made it easier to form right-wing coalitions than, than, uh, than left ones. And that condition has, uh, is at least partially removed by the end of the Cold War. And the experience of the early 2000s does indeed seem to support that hypothesis. That hypothesis. Um, but uh, the struggles of many of those governments to solve problems of injustice and distribution is probably is maybe evidence of many things. Among them, perhaps, that we've over-attributed certain social problems to the conditions of the Cold War. So those are a couple of uh, reflections that I have on. Um, um, on rereading your, your excellent book, and I uh, will leave things there for discussion. Uh, and again, I wish you congratulations uh, on seeing this project through so that it can reach a wider audience. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, and uh, I, I will have a, a comment later on, but uh, uh, there is a, I see one, one hand up. Take your please. Introduce yourself. Okay. Hello. Can you can you hear me? Yes. I would I would just like to make a, a suggestion. I used to train teachers. I, I taught to... Asian history to <laughs> adults. Uh, I taught ancient history and I also taught early American history. And I think college professors are living in their own ivory tower. The first speaker, I would have loved to have heard what he said, but he, his face was not shown and his voice was muted in some way, mumbling. I couldn't hear, understand the word. You should test out or ask your audience at the very beginning, can they understand what you're saying? Then that, be that beautiful lecture might have been worthwhile. And then you have to remember, you're talking to people who are who are young adults and you have to give them in-depth facts with examples, a ton of them. Because if you just talk in college professor-like language, you're gonna bore your students to death. And I take it from a mentor who, trained, who taught teachers in East New York, Brooklyn. These kids, I am telling you, they were from families from prison and you name it. But when I came to demonstrate a lesson, they would clap for me. These are kids who, uh, their mothers, uh, the highest unemployment and crime rate. You've got to understand who you're talking to. You're talking to each other instead of the public and the students. And that's, I'm sorry to tell you that, 
but you don't really understand who you're talking to. It's very nice if you talk to one another, but you've got to remember there are people out there who want examples of what you're talking about, tons of examples. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, there are two more hands. Please introduce yourself. We'd like to know who you are. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Gerardo Sanchez, and I'm a researcher at CIDE in Mexico City. Uh, uh, Bani, thank you very much for that presentation. I mean, we, we have talked about your work for uh, quite a number of years now. And as usual, I have so many questions, but I will just give you one right now. So uh, I think we need to explore a bit more about the end of the Cold War. What, what did that actually meant? for Latin America. And in this sense, I'm, I'm trying to inquire, right, what actually happened when the Cold War ended? So in Latin America, as opposed to other regions, right, we didn't have uh, that big an influence of like the Soviet bloc, the Soviet Union, right? So if we didn't have that influence, then it didn't actually matter that much that the Soviet Union fell or the Berlin Wall fell or whatever, right? I mean, th there was not actually that enormous uh, structural change in the region. Stuff sort of more or less stayed the same. So then wh why did we have this enormous change in the late 1980s and 1990s, right? That actually marked a new period for Latin American history. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, the hand, please go ahead. Yes, I'm Janis Deligakis and I'm a vice president for the International Union for Land Value Taxation, which is a, a, a UK um, um, a organization affiliated with uh, with ECOSOF. Uh, I have I have two questions. One, uh, I think the speakers talked alluded to different nuances in the Latin American left. Some are Marxist, some are not Marxist. And I would like a little bit of elaboration and explanation of what are the different variations of the Latin American left. And second, uh, I wanted the panel to address the case of Uruguay. And why do I, do I mention Uruguay? Because I think Uruguay is a country that has managed to solve the ideological conflicts between socialism or like state managed economy and capitalism because they have a very healthy uh, public sector but at the same time it's not a socialist country per se so i would like to understand why uruguay is doing well and why other countries have not been able to to reconcile this i think artificial conflict between socialism and capitalism which i think was the the main uh, uh, point of conflict during the uh, Cold War. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 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 Mary, let, me, uh, let me make actually a couple of one question and one comment. The question is uh, 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 well, uh, the, uh, let's say uh, Adela mentioned the, 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 the role of the Cuban Revolution. Um, it, isn't there a totally different, let's say, Cold War in Latin America before and after? It's, it's a breaking point. So that before there was not the, the polarization in the sense, uh, and after there is polarization. But also the attitude of the US. I mean, in, in spite of, I mean, Seen it from the point of view of the economists, uh, the US was very interventionist, uh, supporting of Latin America during the Second World War. I mean, the, the negotiations with that, the Inter American Cop Agreement, very active support Latin America, of course, to align Latin America with the last. <laughs> I'm very clear. Uh, but after the Second World War, the US just forgets about that until the Cuban Revolution. <laughs> 
And the Cuban Revolution, uh, first of the Eisenhower and then on the Kennedy, launches a series of policies for Latin America, the creation of the Inter American Development Bank, the Alliance for Progress, and as I said, a series from the point of view of Colombia, the Alliance for Progress was a major shape. But not only that, also it opened a space, let's say, for let's call it progressive uh, a, a policies and land reforms. Uh, I mean, it's not very effective in most countries. Uh, but also uh, some, uh, let's say, reformist government, uh, as you mentioned, uh, trade, for example, in, uh, uh, in Chile, uh, uh, and, you know, you can say even the, the, uh, the Alvarado regime in, in Peru, it was a military regime, was also a reformist uh, regime. Uh, let's say, well, in Colombia, let's say, Peñeras Camargo, uh, uh, who was actually, the, the, uh, let's say, the, the one who signed the for progress, etc. I went to form law uh, Colombia. Uh, anyway, so there was a, a, an opening to to reform this uh, policy that was not there before. So uh, and the U.S. was involved, putting money, trying to intervene. Now, with differences, I, I think Patrick's point that, that there were many different cases is, is, is I think generally correct. The same as that. And that was a uh, that's the point. Now, from the point of view uh, uh, of, of the, um, uh, how do you see the uh, the issue of, the, let's say, of, uh, 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 you know, the relation between this, the Cold War and the politics and the economic uh, debates, let's say. I would say, you know, being more an economic historian, I don't see any effect of the Cold War. I mean, really, no effect. Uh, the uh, I mean, basically, uh, that the America was uh, uh, getting involved into you know inward-looking development uh, because of the Great Depression, in particular, um, and some other process that came from before. And there is continuity. Uh, the discontinuity comes actually with the debt crisis, which has again nothing to do with the Cold War, uh, and, the, and that does generate. Uh, a significant change, and it's more associated to the same fashion and Reagan uh, than to uh, uh, it may, maybe you say that fashion and Reagan are is a Cold War phenomenon. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but anyway, that, uh, so the in terms of economic developments, I really see no effects of the Cold War. Let's start back to the question. I, I we probably should take. I mean, since we only have about a few more than ten minutes. Really? Um, yes. <laughs> perhaps you should just take the floor and okay. try to ask the comments. Yes. Uh, well, um, I think that I might start with uh, Patrick's notes and comments. Um, yeah, the, the first one is, is about uh, William Booth's article, uh, which uh, was actually published after Few years after I think my book uh, came out, and actually that that article would have been very helpful for me if I, if, if, I mean if, if it had been available when I was uh, writing or thinking about my, about my book because uh, the idea of, of layers, right? Some with uh, deeper chronological roots, other with shorter uh, chronological roots. I think it works uh, quite. Quite well, and it gives a much more nuanced uh, vision uh, of uh, what was uh, for the Cold War. Of course, it made me think about my own definition, and I think that in terms of layers, um, it related also to what uh, the uh, just said. Um, economy is clearly uh, a long term process. Uh, and I think 1929, it's, it's a critical uh, date in terms of, of what happened in Latin America. Um, economy, you know, the beginning of uh, the industrialization process, import substitution during the 1930s and 40s, more because of uh, global economic dynamics uh, rather than proactive government uh, policies. But certainly that's, it's, it's a long way. My, my point is that 
However, even if we consider the existence of those rules or processes or dynamics, which are long term dynamics, I, I'm not saying that they don't exist or that the Cold War created Latin American history, no. But what I'm saying is that, yes, the Cold War altered, changed, uh, even hampered uh, certain, certain dynamics and processes. Um, and that's why I introduced the idea of the two fractures, right? Um, fractures of what? Uh, my idea is that in the 1930s and the 1940s, we have two big phenomena. One is uh, a different model of economic development taking off in the region. Industrialization, ISI, uh, and, and diversification of, of, the, of the economies. And the other is a progressive empowerment of progressive actors in the region that culminated in the mid 1940s with what the Fed uh, and Roxburgh called uh, the democratic spring. Uh, when I say fracture, it's because I think that the Cold War somehow altered both dynamics, made them more difficult. So uh, Patrick mentioned um, my idea of how Cold War made left-wing coalitions or progressive coalition uh, more difficult to be uh, created in Latin America after 1947. Uh, so this is a way to see how uh, we can talk of the of, of, of fracture, right? Um, but even if, and, and, and this is what I want to address uh, Ocampo comment. Even in terms of economic development, I think that uh, the problem is that when Latin American governments had to shift from a natural ISI process because there was no trade, uh, because the I mean the economy were naturally inward looking uh, in the 1930s and the 1940s. So when, uh, as Hirschman said, uh, Latin American government to transform those processes in public policies, supporting the continuation of ISI. I would say that the combination of the Bretton Woods system and the Cold War made the um, enactment of those policies more difficult in, in North America. Um, just to give an example of, of it's, a, it's an issue that I deal with in the book. Um, money coming from uh, international uh, organization focused on development, let's say the World Bank. Uh, Organizations that were created at Bretton Woods, and at the beginning, they were thought actually, actually, they were shaped after uh, what had happened in Latin America in terms of, of, of inter American economic cooperation. But as we know, with the beginning of the Cold War, they completely shifted resources and attention first towards Europe uh, and then towards uh, Asian countries. Why? Because a uh, Soviet threat was much more. Uh, was perceived as much more urgent than in Latin America. So uh, certainly, as you say, there was no attention, there was no support for economic development in Latin America until the triumph of the Cuban Revolution. When think, things briefly, because I think it lasted three, four years, uh, in, during the first Johnson government, uh, worship was going to uh, to previous uh, policies towards, towards Latin America. In 1964, we had the Brazil, Even in terms of economic cooperation, I would say that the alliance of progress is mostly over by 1964. Um, so, um, my idea is that those fractures that I was mentioning affect also the economy. Again, it's a combination of Bretton Woods plus how the Cold War forced a, forced a reinterpretation of how Bretton Woods should work, especially, especially in Latin America. But even there, I think you can see um, um, Cold War geopolitics affecting uh, uh, Latin American economics relation uh, with, with, the, with the United States, and then having an impact. Um, the other impact you can see on, on the economy, for example, um, it's uh, the Washington position with regards to in regards to Latin American development uh, programs, uh, state led development programs after World War II. Um, I mean, if you look at what is happening at uh, inter-American conferences between 1947 
and uh, 1948, Latin Americans are basically asking for more support, money, tolerance, I would say, for, for example, protectionist policies that they had to enact to produce that shift from the natural ISI to the state-led ISI. And the reply they received from Washington is basically I mean, the most famous uh, uh, speeches given by uh, Marshall, the same Marshall who is the author of the Marshall Plan in Europe, but that in Latin America replies, no, I mean, in trade is the answer. Uh, your plan for economic development um, uh, do not make any sense economically. They are very expensive, and we are not certainly going to fund uh, those, those plans. Just go back and do what you are good at do, export uh, commodities. And I would say that more or less is the relationship that uh, takes place between the United States and Latin America in terms of economic relations. And again, I think the Cold War is it's quite, it's quite an issue. So much so that it's a, it's a Cold War event, the Cuba Revolution, that somehow has the strength, the power to modify uh, those, those, those relationships. So I think that even in economic terms, there is an impact uh, of the Cold War, perhaps not so evident, not so direct, not, not so verbalized as a, as, as, as a Cold War dynamic. But if we look at what is happening, I think Washington is changing its economic its economic policy towards the region also because of Hong Kong. That's what I what I try to uh, want to actually. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I I convinced you, but we can we will continue the, the discussion later. Uh, if you want. I think I have five minutes. Um. um let me address also the, the question coming from the other. So, the nuances in the left. I mean, what, what was I, I was trying to say is that uh, I mean, if we look at Europe by the end of the 19th century, I think there is a clear tendency to see um, a peculiar form of socialism, which is Marxist. Socialist and after the triumph of the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, even a more peculiar form of socialism, which is Marxist Lenin, Lenin socialist, becoming quite central in the history of Latin American political dynamics. Um, if we look at Latin America, I, I, I would say that the right word is syncretism, right? I mean, if we look at Africa, for example, uh, I mean. And the Latore, of course, is, is strongly influenced by, by the Soviet Revolution. But at the same time, the kind of political uh, program that uh, he offered is based on uh, an alliance between classes, not uh, class conflict. So, I mean, even if he refers to Marxism, uh, I suspect he's most, more, more interested in anti imperialism uh, or the, the, the relevance of Marxist. For anti imperialist positions. Um, but in any case, even if he embraces uh, some sort of, of, of Marxist, I would say that the level of uh, freedom uh, with which he embraces Marxist is, I mean, uh, makes Latin America completely different. Uh, from, and and, and it's, a, it's a variety and a heterogeneity that lasts at least until the beginning. Uh, let's think about parent, okay? It's, it's, it's a phenomenon that, that we see unfolding between the end of World War II and at the beginning of the Cold War. But even parent has become sort of impossible as a political project, both in terms of foreign policy and internally uh, during, uh, during the, uh, the Cold War. And I'm sorry, the last, very last question, Gerardo. No, I wouldn't say that the Soviet Union was not. Uh, like uh, a factor, uh, a, 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 an important factor during the Cold War in Latin, in Latin America. Um, uh, I think that after the triumph of the Cuban Revolution, the Soviet variable is quite important in, in Latin America. Let's think about the missing crisis, okay? It's a clear example of how um, the Soviet Union, through or by means of Cuban, Catholic and accept this uh, definition immediately before, actually. 
should invite you just to make you understand. Um, it's quite important. Uh, and certainly, and here I think I understand from the right when we say that, I mean, at least in this part, that the, the Cold War was to some extent a, a Washington's creation. Um, because, of, I mean, uh, Washington is extremely concerned about the possibility of the Soviets uh, take over in, 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 in Latin America. So, I mean, what happened? And what happened after the end of the Cold War is that at least you don't have Washington pressures or such a strong Washington pressure in containing uh, the autonomy of Latin American political uh, political process. And that's why you have the big tie uh, in Latin America at the end of the Cold War. It's an order that, I mean, as we have constantly seen from Harvard uh, to uh, Allende, was basically impossible in uh, with the end of the Cold War, at least you have that pressure being released, and uh, and, and 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 Latin American processes uh, regained some uh, some degree of autonomy uh, that made possible again, for example, the establishment of left wing coalition. And again, I mean, this would be a counterfactual evidence of what I've just said that something new happened. Around 1947, that was basically over. Around 1989, 1990, 1992. Okay. Uh, not sure I have addressed all questions, but I think. Uh, now the book is raising some. No, no, I think uh, unfortunately time is over. Thank you very much for your. Very interesting presentation. Uh, Adele and Patrick, thank you for your comments. Uh, we have had a very nice discussion. Uh, we, uh, we ask all the audience to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.